A lucid dream is a very particular brain state. The cool thing about this is like people have been researching this for over 40 years. So we have the brain science now. They've put people into EEGs and fMRI scanners and got them lucid to see what is going on. And it's a unique brain state where your dreaming mind is online. So you're fast asleep, you're in REM, you're having a dream. But then something makes you realize that you are dreaming. So we're about to talk about one of my favorite topics of all the topics that we could talk about. It's really about dreaming and lucid dreaming. And a lot of people don't know what lucid dreaming is. It's ultimately knowing that you're dreaming while you're dreaming. And if you do know that you're dreaming while you're dreaming, think of what you could do. You can control anything. You can manifest anything. It's like the world's most amazing video game. And so for a lot of people, they don't even realize they can do it. Some people don't remember their dreams. But today we're going to be talking about, we're talking with someone who's just an incredible guide on helping people understand both why to do it, how to do it, some of the deeper paths if you decided this is something you wanted to do. Uh, but ultimately, it's with the purpose of learning to truly feel alive, to be fully present in your life. If that's something that calls to you. I hope you really enjoy this episode. All right. Hey, everybody. As an Oneironaut and recovering lawyer, she has spent the last seven plus years training in both the modern psychological and neurological approach to lucid dreaming and the Tibetan Buddhist lineage, fusing the wisdom of each into a practical, effective methodology for meaningful lucid dream practice. Uh, what started as a quest to overcome a crippling fear of death, that's so relatable, uh, lucid dreaming quickly revealed itself to be a powerful pathway for psychological integration and spiritual development, a natural, trainable, and direct link into the deepest parts of our own minds. Dedicated to creating an effective pathway for others, she trains people on all levels, of all levels, who are ready to step up and explore the extraordinary state of consciousness. Please welcome one of my teachers, Mia Lux. Thank you for being here with us uh, today, no, Mia. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so uh, this really is my favorite topic. And it's, so we're kind of ending my first season, which I took a little pause because I had a kid and that kind of messed things up schedule-wise. Uh, but, you know, the, this is really touching on what the show is all about for me is the dream beyond. It's really about, you know, what do we dream of and how do we create what we dream of? So we're like so literal today and I'm really excited about that. And the place I want to start with is always when you were little, what did you dream you'd be when you grew up? <laughs> you know, I think it's interesting. This is in the same way that it led me to lucid dreaming, but I think it was in many ways a a lack of sincere dreaming. I think that when I grew up, I didn't I didn't have a dream, unfortunately, if I'm really honest. You know, I think I didn't have a secure enough self structure. I didn't have quite the I think the childhood that allowed for sincere dreaming. So I had a lot of fake dreams. I became a lawyer which was a fake dream. I became an actress, which was a fake dream. So I lived out, unfortunately, a lot of, I'd say, non-lucid dreams in the waking state. Mm, the fake dream. Turns out what I wanted to be when I grew up was to be a lucid dream trainer. <laughs> yeah, it's so meta. Yeah, it's so meta. It's, so what I love about that so much is a lot of times people have asked me, what is it about aviation that I was connected to? Why did I love it so much? And I think it goes back to the idea of, I'll know I made it when there's like some dream people have, like I dream of having a jet, I dream of flying in a jet, I dream of being a pilot, but there's something about the dream of flight that has been so persistent in our consciousness for all of time. And so it's like, how do we make other people's dreams come true? How do we be that dream giver? And in that same way, that's what you do. You help other people literally create their dreams. And it was interesting because they're all connected. I mean, you mentioned how we're going to be working literally with this idea of the dream, the dream beyond, but it's sort of, the the dream state how it impacts waking state too like there's literal but we're, we're working in the symbolic register and that that is the same in our waking state to our dreaming state to our waking state to our dreaming state so what's really interesting about these practices and these conversations is that exactly that that's that kernel of joy excitement or wonder that you had about flight or maybe somebody else has about medicine or someone else has about art like these are things that grow and populate in us both in waking state and dreaming state and we work in both states to manifest them into this reality and so it's kind of cool because it's not they're not compartmentalized our daydreams and our night dreams often are opportunities and guidances for each other which is super cool yeah yeah and i also think it's uh, I, I will say one of my favorite things is that i was told that the top three things people do in dreams once they go lucid and for anyone who doesn't understand lucid we'll explain, we'll explain that in a second but i was told it's Flying is one, 
one of them, one of the three, walking through walls and having sex. Hi, oh, you're walking through walls is the third. Yeah, I mean, flying and sex are, the, are definitely the top two. And then, I mean, for those who are training properly, walking through walls is one of the first things we get people to do. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I would say, like, I'm happy to deliver on one of the top lucid dream experiences in the physical reality that we're in. So it, it feels exactly. really good. <laughs> so, uh, so how do you explain when someone asks you, like, what is this lucid dreaming thing I hear about? How do you explain it? Yeah, the distinction between what a lucid dream is versus a non-lucid dream is really important. Often people come up to me and they're like, oh, I lucid dream every night. But when they explain it to me, they're having vivid dreams. And so a lucid dream is a very particular brain state. The cool thing about this is like people have been researching this for over 40 years. So we have the brain science now. They've put people into EEGs and fMRI scanners and got them lucid to see what is going on. And it's a unique brain state where your dreaming mind is online. So you're fast asleep, you're in REM, you're having a dream, but then something makes you realize that you are dreaming. And as you go, oh my God, this is a dream, a part of your brain activates. It's the right dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. It's a little piece of your brain that's really got to do with your sense of perception, you know, memory and, you know, impulse control. It's essentially a big piece of your conscious self. And that comes back online. And so now you as you are in the waking state, your fully conscious self is online, but you're within the dreaming mind. And these two parts of the brain aren't normally activated at the same time. So essentially, you are in a dream and you know that you're dreaming as you are dreaming. So it's a very specific kind of experience. Uh, vivid dreams, even precognitive dreams, these are different types of dreams. So if you're lucid, you're in the dream and you know that you're dreaming. That's really important to know. And why does it matter? Like if someone's saying, I don't know, lucid dreaming, this sounds silly. What's the point of all this? Again, I just want to like fuck off in a dream. Like what's the real benefit of it? It's a good question. You know, I think you could ask the same question, I guess, with any of these practices, meditation, you know, inquiry, self, self insight. I think if we look at the unique opportunities that lucid dreaming gives us, people can find their own answers to why it matters. So if you consider that lucid dreaming is essentially like being in a fully sensorial, high-definition virtual reality simulator of your own psyche. So if you are in your dream, your dream is literally made out of your own mind. Every night we do this naturally. We go in, our thoughts, our ideas, our feelings, they all populate into these very dynamic, very active experiences. Your brain is working harder in REM than in waking state because it's generating reality. So imagine now stepping into that self-generated reality but you're fully aware that you're in a dream. And you can touch, you can taste, you can feel. And because you're fully aware, you can collaborate. So you would now have direct access to your own unconscious mind. Now think about the strength of therapies like, like hypnotherapy, right? Or visualization. All the things that those modalities can achieve. Lucid dreaming is like that, but times a thousand. You can ask questions. You can summon aspects of your psyche. You can do wish fulfillment, like having... I mean, I, one of my favorites is like riding on dragons, crazy things that you could never do in real life, but they feel like they're real. And so, you know, when we're exploring, we're like, why does this practice matter? It can go anywhere from just like, wow, this is the most incredible, psychedelic, awe-inspiring experience of consciousness just to be there and to experience it. And then all the way through to the more sophisticated training. You know, if we do the, the dream yoga practices, which really use the lucid dream state from the Tibetan lineage to do spiritual practice. So starting to inquire into the nature of reality, inquiring into the nature of consciousness. So there's a whole spectrum of things. And I think the, the trick here is to realize like, wow, lucid dreaming is essentially a built-in pathway into this kind of other dimensionality where you can work skillfully with your own mind, either for fun or therapeutically. It's the possibilities. So, it's a choose your own adventure, you know? <laughs> yes, I love that. I used to love those books. Oh, me too. What What is a specific example of, like from the practical perspective, I know we could go off into the spiritual for days, um, but from a practical perspective, can you share with me something that you actually worked through in a lucid dream and how it, how it impacted you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so one of the ways, I mean, for anyone familiar with, I mean, let's just take, let's just take psychology because I think that's a good midway point between just doing wish fulfillment or doing spiritual practice. For anyone who's sort of done any therapy or worked with their own mind, maybe they've done some IFS or parts work or anything like that, 
done some visualization, hypnotherapy. If you think about like the mechanisms of that process, it's usually about working with what Jung would call your shadow. So working with different compartmentalized, repressed parts of yourself that because they've kind of been squished aside, they're kind of unconsciously dominating and ruling your behavior in the background. So a lot of the work we do psychologically is to skillfully recover and integrate those parts of ourselves. And that could be a long process. But let's say with lucid dreaming, what I'll do is I'll go into the dream and let's take my money shadow. I once was like, okay, what the hell is going on? I was, I was hitting a ceiling in terms of my earnings. And I was like, I think I have some work around money. And so I went into the dream, I got lucid and I summoned, I said, money shadow, come to me. And I turned around with the full expectation that my money shadow would be there. And sure enough, this strange dream figure arrives. And she's like an accountant, kind of in like a suit, but she's like a lizard person. She's like this like lizardy person with kind of straggly hair and shy and nervous. And I asked her, are you my money shadow? And she was like, yes. And I asked her, what do you believe about money? And she said, oh, well, you know, you have to work very, very hard. And the minute you leave your desk, you stop making money and all your hair falls out. I remember being like, oh, my God, that's a terrible belief structure to have. And I've got this lurking in my system. So then what do you do? Was, and by the way, these are things you train for. So I go, okay, I want to integrate my money shadow. And so I had her lie down and I summoned this beautiful golden kind of egg of light that I put her in. I asked my, my mind to put on some meditation music and it started playing this binaural beat that I love from YouTube. And I just had to send all of my love into this aspect of myself, full acceptance, full forgiveness, full like making amends with. And as I did that, she transformed and she burst out of this golden bubble as this brilliant, giant, golden Chinese dragon. And she turned and she said to me, she said, I, am, I was a money worm and now I am a wealth dragon. And she flew off. And I woke up from that just like, wow. And, you know, knowing, of course, that the unconscious works in the symbolic registry, waking up to that feeling is like, it's hard to explain, but in a lucid dream, the direct interaction means that the integration, it's immediate. It's not like something you have to process, like a psychedelic, psychedelic journey or something like that. You wake up and you've had this immediate and direct reclaiming of this aspect of yourself. And it's, I mean, it's one of those beautiful things to experience. It really is. And you can do that I with love that. your inner child, with your sexual shadow, you know, with your f fear of anything, with a phobia. Again, because it's an entirely open world of your own psyche, whatever it is that you're struggling with in your waking state, you can bring into the dream, summon intentionally, and then integrate. And from a practical level, that just creates a degree of, you know, peace, I think, baseline it, wholeness. It's like the, it's moving towards individuation. Mm. That's a beautiful story. Yeah, I've, I've done, I've really struggled with my lucid dreams, being able to hold that long of an experience. I know that that's part of the practice is being able to extend the amount yes. of time that, that you're holding that lucidity. But one of my, one of my early experiences was meeting my resistance to the feminine. It was a similar thing. It was like a scary woman that appeared in my dream. And did, and remember, did you summon her or were you like, did you deliver? No, deliberately she call showed her up. Out? She sh Well, so I, that was what I had I'd said. Like, I had done like a practice before but where you draw the picture of what you want to meet. And so I said, like, I want to meet that, that, that resistance to the feminine. And when I was in the dream, I was like, this is a nightmare. I thought I was actually in my real room and there was a, like a scary woman. And I remember like I had this moment where I guess my, prefrontal cortex came out light enough to be like, wait, don't fight her, hug her and love her. And so like I wrapped my arms around her and I woke up at, like literally when I woke up, I was having uh, what felt like convulsions, almost like Kundalini vibration in my body. And I was able to unpack like, oh, wow, I think that was like, um, like Young talks about the idea that every man has, I think it's the anima or the animus. It's like the, the yes. opposite gender polarity within us. And I was like, oh, that was my own inner feminine that I don't like. Right. It was the reason I got bullied as a kid was because I was kind of like lovey and cuddly and huggy. And then all of a sudden, here's this part of me that was like, no, that's my vulnerability. That's my weakness. I don't want anyone to see it. And there exactly. I was integrating it in. And I was like, wow, that's. And to your point, it was like that. It was as soon as I woke up, the energy had already moved. And I'm like, what do I do at this? Like, there's nothing to do. Now you are that. Now you are connected to that. Um, I and that's love been really that. powerful. It's been really powerful. So I, I do explain to people when I meet them, if someone gives me any in to talking about lucid dreaming or dream yoga, I'm like, treat me like an eight-year-old talking about dinosaurs because I will talk your ear off. It is truly, I think that there is something so deeply profound about this work. And, and for me, like when I've had people say, why should I care about this? I generally go back to like very like 
Pema Chodron type stuff, which is, it is a, a practice of learning to die. And people go, how does that relate to dying? It's like, every night when we fall asleep, we slip away. And if we could slip away with intention and power and like, consciously, we can learn to not fear death. And if we don't fear death, then we can truly live. But I, I, I also really like think about like a video game where like, I just want to level things up. I want to like get new armor and a new sword and like do all the things in the dream. But for me, it really has... I mean, when, you, when I said it in your intro that for you is it really about crippling fear of death, I think that's the deep underlying work for me. And I, I imagine a lot of people relate to that. I think that's, I think it's a really beautiful observation. And I think the way that you, the way that you share so eloquently around this is, is interesting because they're, they're not separate, right? Like, so in terms of like, I, I like to think of the, you can think of this work as like this like pre-personal work where you're digging into your really early childhood. So this where so many of the wounds that we experience were formed, often pre-verbally. And to access that stuff, we often have to access the unconscious. It's very hard to do pre-personal work just from the conscious mind and like talk therapy. We have to work with, you know, whether it's lucid dreaming or hypnosis or plant medicine, whatever it is, people find their different ways to access that part to help build, rebuild those foundations where we perhaps had wounding. And that strengthens the personal work. We start developing really healthy self-structures, a really healthy ego, not an ego that's, you know, crippled and reactive. And so to try and build as healthy of a self-structure as we can, which both of those things then allow us to do that transpersonal work, which is working with death, working with the nature of reality. We then have this incredible foundation where we can experience those states and bring them back and integrate them into our lives. I mean, this. I mean, we know this. We see. We see so many spiritual leaders who they're so good at state access, right? They're not afraid of death, and they have these amazing meditation experiences. But they're stealing money, or they're sleeping with their followers. We go, how can this be? And so, like the the psychological integration of having like a mature human development, a healthy self structure, is so important because when you go to those states, whether it's like a lucid dreaming state, or a psychedelic state, or a meditation state, how you interpret that, imply it, depends on your developmental level. Uh, what I love about lucid dreaming is you can pitch this work anywhere you need a bit of bolstering. So if you're like, man, I need to go work with my pre-personal, your unconscious remembers it all, right? So you can go in and work with like what happened in the womb. What was your womb trauma? You can work with past life stuff. I mean, it depends on your belief system here, but plenty of people who believe in that and work with their past life regression within the dream it works or you can do psychological integration get the armor like build yourself like really build a strong healthy effective sense of self or go into these death practices and so i love what you're saying there about like the mirroring between every night when we go to sleep and that's exactly what the tibetan buddhists do which is you know the lineage i've mostly trained in which is really working with the dream as the practice for how we transit from physical to non-physical states of consciousness and every night being an opportunity over and over again to practice the sense of self-dissolution into complete non-dual openness and then reconstitution back into a sense of self then dissolution and reconstitution it's like this dance we're doing every 24 hours without ever knowing it right and the more yeah. awareness we bring to it the more we can practice what at first you as you and i both know what we've chatted about is super uncomfortable Right? Like, I mean, I'm curious, like the first few experiences you've had of this, like, what did it feel like to you when you started, like, whether it's through dreaming or psychedelics, like, what do you, what has it been like for you practicing the dissolutions? Yeah. I mean, so for me, I actually, I first experienced a lot of sleep of uh, like anomalies in my twenties. So it was to the point where I went to NYU to do a sleep study because I thought I was losing my mind. I, I was experiencing something that they call from a technical term, exploding head syndrome. Where as I was falling asleep, I would hear this cacophony of sound and I'd feel like I was vibrating and I would wake up and look out the window because I thought we were under nuclear attack. It was so, so aggressive. You know, I think I got the answer from a scientific and a medical perspective what was happening, but it was only like 20 years later or 15 years later when I got more of the spiritual perspective of what was going on. And uh, the way it was described to me was that there's this waking consciousness and there's this dream consciousness. And if you're aware of the transition between the two and you're actually present for it, or if you're present to witness, it was like tuning between two radio stations and there's all this static between the two. And I was like, wait, you're telling me I stayed awake as I was going from a, a falling, you know, I was falling asleep, but I never actually lost consciousness and ended up right in a dream. 
It was so terrifying. It was one of the scariest things I ever experienced, but it was kind of the the blessing. It was like, almost like, what do they say for, you know, there's like a spiritual break. This was my spiritual break. It was, what the hell is this? What's wrong with me? Only to find out like, actually, this might be a gift and this might be a blessing. And it, I mean, it was 15 years before I had gone back to it and like ended up in Charlie's course, Charlie Morley's course on, on lucid yeah. dreaming. But yeah, for a long time, I just didn't know what it was and who do I talk to, right? It's like I go to literally the NYU sleep doctor who says like, oh, we think you might have a slight snore that's waking you up in the middle of your dream state and you're probably also sleep deprived. And that was it. I was like, oh, what do I do with that? Nothing. Go find Nothing. another pathway, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Truly. It, it, was pretty, it was pretty difficult. But it, like, I'm wondering for you, like, when did you, what was your spiritual break moment? Or what was the moment where mm. you were like, I clearly have a gift? Because I don't think, I know anyone can learn to lucid dream, but there are some people that have a real aptitude. And I'm, I'm assuming that you are one of those people. Yes. And it's, you know, it's interesting as, you know, again, this is where perspective, cosmology offers different explanations, right? And I think one of the things I have held dearly to my heart recently is is really understanding cause and effect and not just within potentially one lifetime but potentially across different lifetimes and this idea that whatever blessings we have now is usually because of hard work done in the past and often what challenges we have now are also because of choices in the past. And so taking, whether it's within your own lifetime or across lifetimes, this incredible view of whatever is here right now is a natural consequence of something that was before, which means that, wow, what an opportunity to work with it newly to plant new seeds for different consequences. I say that because when you have certain, I think, gifts or dispositions to these sorts of more advanced practices, it's super important to hold it within the context of being the fruit of hard work. Uh, And I really believe that. So I think for me, I mean, I had a challenging upbringing and a lot of suppressed trauma and my I think my break really came in stages I had sought for so long any possible explanation that could help shift I think the 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 default state of suffering I was in just like so much suffering and the suffering I saw all around me and did all the normal things, you know, success, a lawyer, this, like, I really went down the sparkly route first. I, I, I bought into the, I was like, everyone says this is what it is. So maybe if I'm just this enough, I'm just that enough. I'm just this enough. And really just like worked hard on that um, and became really, you know, suffered more in the process. And so I think really my spiritual break came when I just, I don't even know what triggered it, but I just like, I woke up and I remember just being like, I had this realization that I had no idea what happens when we die. I don't know what I believe. And that I couldn't see how I could make a single meaningful choice about my life without really knowing what I believed and recognizing that I lived in the shadow. Was it what Nietzsche says in the shadow of God? I didn't believe in a Christian God, but I was living my life according to basic Christian morality because that was the culture I was in. I was behaving as if there was a heaven without believing in a heaven. And the truth is, if you ask yourself, if you believe that you were only a sack of meat and there is no afterlife, we're just a bunch of cells, then the parameters of how you live your life might be very different to someone who believes that there are either multiple lives, there's karmic consequences or heaven or hell. And so it just turned my life upside down. And I started having developing just like I said, this crippling fear of death of just not being able to go to sleep at night, terrified of everyone around me dying, terrified of dying, terrified of dying because I was like, I don't know what this is. And so then the question, which I'm sure, I know you've asked yourself too, which is like, okay, cool. Well, like, how do I die before I die then? Because you can read all the books you want about dying and people's perspectives, but I'm like, that's just like picking a team versus having the personal experience. And that's what led me to lucid dreaming because there's a, because of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition of working with the dream space to work with the bardo. So practicing the lucid dream to wake up so that when you die, they believe you go into a dreamlike state and that you have an opportunity through the dying process, the dissolution of the body, the dissolution of the elements to recognize and wake up, essentially become enlightened. And also when you're in the bardo state, which is like this big overwhelming dream state, if you've practiced getting lucid in the dream, that you could get lucid there. And again, all of those moments lead to liberation. So they then are no longer stuck coming back here life after life after life in this kind of unconscious replication of trauma. 
So high stakes for the Tibetan Buddhists, right? Like this is like high stakes. And that experience you described, the ex- what do they call it? exploding head syndrome, is that what they called it? So funny. That ability to actually stay conscious through the sleep paralysis, which causes all the crazy hallucinations and the audio hallucinations you're hearing. That's one of the advanced practices, right? The falling asleep conscious practices or the wild practice. And like that's that practice specifically is what helped me really change my perspective on death. Because when you do that, you're in your bed, as you know, like there you're falling asleep. And then with through usually through meditative practice or through just being born the way you were born, but usually through meditative training, you learn how to stay fully conscious as you pass through the hypnagogic imagery into the sleep paralysis where your body starts to like literally paralyze and shut down but your consciousness is awake so you start to hear audio hallucinations feel a presence in the room feel pressure on your body all kinds of stuff happens before popping into a fully formed dream but that experience is like going from the physical body into a what feels like another physical body but in a completely different dimension for me that broke that that like it broke the impossibility that consciousness could go on beyond the body I always thought it was impossible and and after that those first experiences I was like okay this is possible there's something different here and so I think this is again the opportunities here where I love lucid dreaming for the fact that it is a completely sober pathway because people have these experiences on psychedelics all the time the trouble with that is that often there's a piece of our brain that goes well I was on psychedelics you know, like there's, there's always like a slight caveat around the container for a lot of people. But when you train in something like this and you do it completely sober through the natural mechanisms of how your mind and body and soul function, uh, it's like being a pure scientist of consciousness. And what you experience there, what you test, what you learn, uh, you don't have to doubt it. And like, like we talked about, it becomes instantly integrated into your understanding of yourself and of life, including death. So... Uh, definitely, yeah. I mean, it's a journey. <laughs> this stuff is not yeah. like lucid dreaming has wish fulfillment to it too, but there's a hardcore side to this training too. There's like the, the spiritual warrior element to this training too. Yeah. I mean, even as we're talking about this idea of when you die, if you can stay conscious in the transition, you're given some other options that may not play out if you don't. I just feel like the dread in my stomach. So what I'm going to ask instead <laughs> is... Let's let's go to a very simple question. And again, it's partly based on the inspiration of what you shared. Uh, so how can people, or going back to money, because I think money is one of those things. Money feels like death when you don't have it and God-like when you do. It, it's like I can create, I can have influence. But the, the, And then for the people that have it and think it's going to leave, it is kind of a parallel for dying. It's like I, I, we have life, we have the time, we're already here. But if we're always afraid of dying, it's like I'm always afraid I'm going to run out of money. And so I'm never going to truly live. I'm never going to truly feel the wealth of what I have. So I'd be curious to kind of dive into the money conversation since it's so relevant, especially a lot of the people that listen to the show are like the alphas, the hard charging winners at life that often are externally winning, but don't feel it inside. And again, I I may relate a little bit to that of like, yeah, I I have the things, but what if it all went away? It's It's a death. It's a death. So first, like when you met this money dragon, this golden Chinese money dragon, did money change in your life? Yes. I mean, this is, this is the cool thing about lucid dreaming is that, I, I, listen, I'm a functional person. I don't like doing work that doesn't work. To me, it's a waste of time. Like I'm not a, I'm not like a, yay, do my affirmations, wavy. I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm the most woo-woo, non-woo-woo person I've met. I'm so woo-woo, but I'm also like, I'm like, I'm woo-woo in the way of like, does this work? Like I, I want- yeah. I want to see and feel and experience measurable, tangible results in my life. The reason this stuff works is because the way that I see it from from kind of a practical perspective is that, as I'm sure most people who are listening to this will appreciate, so much of our life, how we feel about ourselves, how we approach things, how things go, is, is a direct result of our constructed belief systems. What you believe deeply, unconsciously about different aspects of your life truly just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy so if you want to talk about like you know people want to say oh manifestation or this or that i'm like yeah or cause and effect i prefer cause and effect because we are constantly planting the causes of how we feel what we create and what comes to be in our life and if you think of this from like a a, 
a belief constructed perspective. Let's say, and a lot of people who who either like let's say have bad beliefs about money. They're afraid of it. They're ashamed of it. Or like the one I had. I grew up believing that you had to work incredibly hard and that money was tied to time, right? It's a really lame belief. Like if that's true, like I had felt, then my money was always tethered to how many hours I was selling, right? So those are interesting constructions. But for some people, for instance, they built success and wealth in order to survive and be safe. If I have money, I'll be safe. If I have money, um, I'll be able to survive. If I have money, I'll be able to protect myself. So people create from different perspectives too. And something I found really interesting is that people who are super, super, super successful often have incredibly strong survival motivations or self-worth motivations. This was life or death for them, which is why they succeeded and they succeeded epically. Of course, the problem is that the, that the actual success doesn't cure this, this where it's coming from. And so you can have billions of dollars and still feel like you're falling behind. Because it's this deep core loop that's going to run and run and run. So where lucid dreaming gets interesting is that you can directly address that loop. So if you have a belief that I like it's never enough, no matter what I do, it's never enough. It just doesn't matter what you do. It's, it, it, it really is never going to be enough. If you go into a lucid dream and you summon, I summon like a personification of that not enoughness and you interact with it and you integrate it. This is now addressing these root causes. Again, you can do this through different method- methodologies. Like there's many roads up the mountain. I love lucid dreaming specifically because it has a much greater range and it's very, and it's very direct and personal. But you could do this with like a belief work uh, specialist or you could do this probably with hypnotherapy. Anything that's going to get you right into the unconscious. But if you did that and you're taking it on, then you are now emotionally free to relate to your wealth differently. So instead of looking at your wealth and going, it's never enough, you might start to have feelings of sufficiency for the first time. You might start to have feelings of like, wow, I have so much. Maybe I could like di- redirect to allocate some of these resources to other things. It frees up the creative faculties to start re-seeing your world so you're not just stuck in this repetitive loop from childhood. Um, and that's with everything, right? Love, money, anything that you're working with is we're, we're usually trapped in our very poorly constructed reactive childhood constructions of our, of ourselves like there's very yeah which is beautiful because of the opportunity but also challenging when you're a grown-up living according to a five-year-old's fears <laughs> which yeah. so many of us are yeah this is bringing up have you heard of the book existential kink yes yes yeah so i just uh i just went through that and the line that two lines came out of that that are really important one was uh if you have, if you've got it, it's because you want it. And so, yeah, it's like if something bad is happening in my life, some part of me, some some unconscious part of me wants to be right about that fear. There's not enough, so I'm going to make sure that I am right about the fact that there's not enough, and I will keep making choices unconsciously that will drive me to that outcome. And I was like, so that's even like, that's even an interesting thing. Is it's like, hey, you're, that's how powerful I am that I'm literally yeah. creating with parts of me that I don't even know. If I can reprogram and, and being that honest the about the emotional payoff, you know, I think this is where this is where like self reflective honesty gets really gritty. Is like being honest with ourselves about where there may be emotional payoffs in the things that we claim that we hate. Yeah, you know, I had a lucid dream where I met a I met a dream figure who beautiful woman who was like just in like black lingerie, covered in roses, rose tattoos big red tattoos with big black thorns and she had all these patches of scars all over her and she was like really interesting looking I could feel immediately I was like oh this is like a very important dream figure so I went up to her and I asked her I said you know what do you represent and she said I represent the part of you that collapses into depression when they feel overwhelmed because then no one can expect you to do anything you can't get in trouble for not doing anything because you're depressed and I was like, whoa, I was like super confronting and integrated her. And I, you know, I didn't have a conscious understanding of that. But when I had tracked it back, I was like, my, when I was younger, I dealt with like, I'd say uh, more like physiological depressions, but I had had these sort of like many depressive episodes. They were all exactly this tethered to times of the opportunity to step up into greater responsibility or stepping up into greater self-expression. And the fear of that, the fear of, of not being good enough, the fear of it's too much. 
meant I would just, I would use depression, I would collapse into depression as a way of getting out of it. Because then no one was like, oh, what a, what a, it's like, oh, shame piece, she's depressed and, you know, there's compassion for me. And so I was using that. I'm like, and that's like, it's like hard to own some of that sometimes. We look, we're like, oh yeah. my God, I was like, I was creating and enjoying and, but this is the beauty of the work because once you see it, you're like, huh, see it with love and see it with no judgment. Yes. Uh, you're free of it. And I, and I think it's again, never again, once that integration happens, it's, it's like, it's like when people tell you Santa Claus doesn't exist and the magic's gone. It's the same with this. Once you see and integrate these structures, they're gone. Like you, you couldn't trick yourself into it again. The trick, the veil has been lifted. Yeah, I actually just, I was processing that there was an aspect, there was a behavior I had historically that I, I would walk away and go, why do I do that all the time? And it was specifically, I'd love to meet people at a dinner, people I don't know, and I would love to lose them 15 to 30 minutes into the dinner. Like I wanted to see if I could embarrass myself or literally say something that they would judge me so deeply for that I would lose. They would be like, this guy sucks. And then the goal was to win them back by the end of the dinner. I wanted to see if I could actually turn it around. And like, it was the whole hero's journey. Like, at, what Was is this it, a at, conscious thing? Like, were you like, were you going in like, oh, no, I, I like playing this game? No, I didn't realize. I didn't realize it. Like, it's only recent that I look back and I was like, the real like existential kink of it was that I loved feeling all hope is lost. I am fucked. Like, no one likes me. I'm alone. I, whatever. I'm just like, I'm going to go cry about it later. And then seeing like, again, it was like that final act in a movie where it's like, all hope is lost, but I turned it around. And there's this redemption moment. And by the end, it was yeah. like, it would always go from like, these people think I'm the worst person on the planet to like, wow, they really feel connected. And there's like almost this weird sense of intimacy in the connection of it. And I was like, that's like, what a wild behavior. What a strange thing to do just to feel. And it was almost like this desire to feel that polarity. I wanted to feel the full polarity of I'm the worst person to now I'm suddenly likable or lovable or whatever this illusion is that I was creating. And as I processed it, I was like, that's, that's kind of shitty to do that to people. <laughs> like it was also, no one signed up for that journey at dinner. And I was just kind of living out this pattern again and again and again. And it was almost like, it was almost as if like, I was worried that people wouldn't like me. So like, let me just cut you off at the pass. And then, and then thinking of like, ah, like when they do like me, they truly like me because they've also seen the worst in me. So this must be, yes. I can trust them yes. because I've shown them my bad side. And, you know, like that is a quite a remarkable pattern Yes, I mean, in terms of like, wow, that's a lot of work. But we're all doing yes. that to smaller degrees with each other all the time. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's what's so important to notice is that even, I mean, even subtle people pleasing, right? The way we we very subtly change our body language, our tone of voice, our whatever to make other people more comfortable or to make them happy or to elicit a positive response from them. I mean, there's so many yeah. different layers to this again. And and I guess like the point, back to like, what's the point of this work is like to be free, to be free of all these kinds of coping mechanisms and, you know, different distortions of the self that we put ourselves and other people through and to like create more whole, calibrated, centered, regulated selves from which then we could be like in really authentic expression and relationship around. And if now <laughs> authentic expression sometimes means people don't like us, that's fine, but we're not actively pushing them away. Um, sometimes it means that they will like us and we welcome that. But really this idea of like, of like bringing all of those neuroses that have <laughs> calcified over time into these epically strange behaviors, like bringing those all back into the fold so that we no longer have to play out these invisible dramas with other people we're able to be free of that and instead focus our attention on the things that truly matter to us in terms of what am I here in this lifetime to do? I don't want to spend my whole life just like repeating disappointing patterns of my childhood. I want to bring that into the fold and then I want to experience and explore like what did me as this particular human, me here in this moment in time, like what is it that I could build, create and contribute to the world if I wasn't so wrapped up in my own self-misery and pity and suffering and that's such a yeah. great question for all of us right and then I think whenever I ask someone this question like we all instinctively know like you you know you had this like love for flight I feel like the blueprints for 
I guess one of my teachers, uh, Dr. John Churchill, would call like our bodhisattva selves. Like the blueprint for the bodhisattva self is inside of us already. And once we've done enough cleanup work, it just starts to naturally blossom in us. Um, So just for context, for those people that have no idea what a bodhisattva is, how would you explain that? Yeah, it's a beautiful. So bodhisattva, I mean, it's really an awakening being would be the translation. But the way you can think of it and the way certainly that we use it as someone who is fully dedicated to the path of waking up. So becoming a fully integrated, awake soul who's here in this planet, not just to kind of dawdle along, get a nice house and a car, but really to like fully clean themselves up internally. So starting always with yourself, integrating all of the disintegrated aspects of your psychology, your pre-personal, but then training in the transpersonal. So tra- training in the, whether that's, I mean, Bodhisattva is the Tibetan Buddhist lineage, but whether that's training in um, the Toltec lineage of transpersonality, or even the Christian transpersonal lineage, where you're now connecting up and beyond higher for yourself, interconnecting to the the web of humanity, of life, of the planet, and and acting from that place of of coming to serve, help, and contribute. Versus just, you know, the mostly the model we grew up in, which was like, survive. And if lucky, collect some resources. And if lucky, you know, maybe have someone who loves you and then kind of hobble to the end of your life, have a usually a tragic illness and long death, suffer in fear, and then pass away. <laughs> that's kind of, that's kind Sign of what me we've up. built as, you Sign know, like, up. That sounds oh great. my God. <laughs> right? Versus the the cross cultivation both like not just being like oh i'm a spiritual fairy and materialism doesn't matter like no we're in a material universe so like a fully integrated here in this plane here now but also integrating in spirit and death and all the incredible wisdom practices that we have available to us so bodhisattva self is like your highest self on times 10 let's put that way i love that um the bravest version as well I like I like that a lot. Actually, I like that guy. I meet him once in a while, and I'm trying to bring him yeah. in a lot more. Um, yeah. So, so someone listened to this, and they're like, "Wow, this is really interesting. How do I go about this?" And for people that have shown interest in your life, what's the path you send them down to start dabbling into this? The way I like to put it to people is that lucid dreaming is a skill set, and some people do have a natural propensity, some people don't, but it's still a skill set. And so much of it just depends on whether you really want to do this. It really does. Uh, And your patience, like not just like, I want to do it now and have it work right now, but I want to do this and I want to commit to this and explore it. And I'm, I'm going to be exploring my consciousness for the rest of my life. So cool. So I always encourage people, like if you're curious in lucid dream about lucid dreaming to just take a second and just ask, like, are you really curious? And if your answer is like, no, no, I'm really curious. Like I really, 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 really want to. Then, I mean, you can start anyway. You can start with grabbing like the, the, the best beginner book I love to give people is Charlie Morley, who is also my first teacher, uh, Dreams of Awakening. That's an amazing book because it teaches the, most of the fundamental skills, but also within a kind of a more spiritual context, which is great. But from a practical point of view, you can, you can literally start tonight. If you want to do something tonight to begin this process, it's about intentionally entering the dream space so create a five to ten minute pre-sleep ritual so rather than just going to bed and zonking out meditate for a little bit or read a little bit about lucid dreaming or just make sure you're off your phone and you know doing some breath work whatever it is that can like kind of create a bit more intentionality and then as you're falling asleep setting a very very strong intention to get lucid in your dreams to recognize that you're dreaming and then first thing in the morning there's like bookends to make sure you dream journal first thing in the mornings. And we do this for two reasons. The dream journal is going to get your reticular activating system, which is you know filtering in and out all the things that are or aren't important to you. It's going to retrain your brain to be like, dreams are important. Every morning, I'm having to write down my dreams. Dreams must be important. So part of the dream journaling is simply to develop a habit that signifies how important this is to your brain, which means you'll remember more dreams and you'll start to become, bring more awareness into your dreams. And the second part is with your dream journal is you're going to start noticing patterns. And that's going to help you as you start to notice like, ah, I dream a lot about this or a lot about this, not just for self-understanding, but more so that you can later use those as a way to get lucid. Because you're like, if I'm always dreaming about dolphins, 
but I'm in the middle of Arizona. Next time I dream about, next time I see a dolphin, I'm probably dreaming. So, but even just using those two bookends, a strong intention and then capturing your dreams, that can do a lot to just revive your dream space and even start the lucid dreaming process. So if you want to do something tonight, that's what you could do. But otherwise, yeah, start with a great book, like just pick a book, start reading and there are great trainers out there. I mean, I train people. I don't have any spots for one-to-one right now, but I do small group programs. I'm also doing a free program at the moment, so we'll probably continue doing those with Andrew Holacek. So there's lots of stuff out there if you want to if you want to join. You just want to find something that suits the feeling you have and your cosmology, something that really right. lights you up and that you feel uh, a resonance with is the trick. What's an example of an intention that you'd recommend to people or that you use? Yeah, so I would use something like if you want to reactivate your dream recall. So let's say you're like, ah, I don't even remember my dreams. If you don't remember your dreams, I would use something simple like tonight I choose to remember my dreams. And just repeat it over to yourself like 15 times. Tonight I choose to remember my dreams. Tonight I choose to remember my dreams. If you want to get lucid, so you already have some dream recall, but you're wanting to wake up in your dreams, uh, choose something. Again, language is personal. The one that I use is I know that I'm dreaming as I am dreaming. I know that I'm dreaming as I'm dreaming. But it could be something like, I get lucid in my dreams tonight. Or it could be something like, I recognize the dream for what it is. So here, this is part of the joy. It's like you're mastering and knowing your own psyche. Choosing language that's going to excite, activate, empower you. So you want to have this feeling of like, yeah, hell yeah. And so you can play with different language and then and then find the thing that feels most kind of I guess, uh, energizing to you and Who? you'd use that one. And then my last question to you is, and I, I love asking you this question of all people, what is your dream beyond? I can answer this in any interpretation I want. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. My dream beyond is a world where the, the baseline skills of nervous system regulation, emotional regulation, the self-reflective capacities, like this, that these skills are available and taught in the same way that we teach ABCs, that we have this kind of emotional and psychic literacy that is built into our cultures in the same way that we were like, okay, we're going to just teach everyone how to read and write. And we have developmental phases and we start like, like that that becomes so integrated into our culture that most people are operating from a safe, secure space. And then that from there, we build a different version of human reality to what we're seeing now. Instead of the wheel, the wheel of samsara spinning faster and faster and crunchier and crunchier, crazier and crazier, that we start moving the momentum the other direction. And from this like baseline of integrated behavior, start to build an incredible civilization with, I guess, like this idea of like the bodhisattvic heart really at the center of it. And then from there, who knows what we would create as a species? Who knows what we would create, what we'd find? Like that, that is my dream beyond. That's beautiful. That's better than someone saying, I want a swimming pool. <laughs> right? So it's like. A little bit harder too, but we're working on it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It. Small steps, small steps. But, um, no, I really, I, I love that. I love the idea of seeing this show up in the curriculums of, you know, uh, I just had a kid 10 weeks ago, which is a real, man, talk about going unconscious a lot. Um, and I think a lot about that of like, what, 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 what did I learn in school that actually mattered? And it's such a small percentage. I do come back to this. If someone could learn their own system, learn to trust their intuition, learn to even know what their body wants, what their heart wants. I mean, that's been my dream is I just wish I could figure that out and then go create that and live it. And yeah, I really hope that for my son. And I hope that, that your dream beyond plays out very soon. I think that'd be amazing. How much time you and I, you and I have spent and many people have spent big chunks of our adulthood having to unpack and rebuild kind of suboptimal experiences from childhood. Imagine if we were able to just increase the average a little bit in the human experience so that human beings didn't have to do so much sort of rehab work on themselves. If your son gets the opportunity to learn some of these skills for himself so he can self-regulate, self-reflect from a young age, then he can spend his 20s and 30s building towards things that matter to him 
of yeah. expressions he wants to see in the world versus like wondering why he keeps sabotaging every relationship he's in or whatever it is, right? And yeah. I think that is the that is a huge opportunity for us as individuals and as and as a collective. Well, in that way, I see you as an art teacher because I do think that it is really about allowing people to create from their most true essence, yeah. not creating from a need for validation, the, the the illusion of love or whatever whatever that is. Just like this feels like something that must come through me, and and I, I love that you do that with people. So again, I just I greatly admire your work. I greatly admire the way you show up and make this relatable that you can dance between the ethereal and the practical. I just want to share a couple of the points that I really took away from this. Just beautiful reminders of the idea. And I, th I think this will be my answer going forward. If people ask, why should I do this? Because I think it is learning to be awake in the dream is learning to be awake in your life. I really do think it's, uh, someone once said to me, it's not about lucid dreaming. It's about lucid living. And, and I really do sit with that. And I think of the, all the times in my life when I have been asleep at the wheel and I'm like, yeah, we, I may live 85 or 110 years, but how much of that was I truly awake for? How much of that was I truly conscious for? And it's, it's not so short when, when, when we're fully there for it. It doesn't feel like life just goes by if we're fully there for it. So I think that's a beautiful invitation. And I really do think that so much of this is you were talking about the idea of like healing these aspects of ourselves or integrating in these pieces of ourselves that are playing out these, these patterns that are not serving us. What I saw is like, I truly do get to be the creator the sooner I get to integrate these things in the sooner I get to see those parts of myself that aren't serving me. And it's being a creator, a teacher and a guide. Like that's the, that those are the words that came through is like, we all get to be creators, teachers and guides once we've met our true essence and healed those things that aren't even ours. Someone else gave them to us potentially. Uh, and, and the, the, the last thing more, more to the, the practical, uh, just a great reminder of, again, just setting that dream intention. And I know it sounds like woo-woo to be like, how do I do that? It's like, I don't know, just say it in your head, say it out loud, whatever that thing is. But really just setting that intention of, um, you know, I I, I, I want to remember that dream tonight. I, I, I want to be present in the dream. You know, I know that I'm dreaming as I'm dreaming. I think that's fantastic. And the last invitation you had that that was fantastic was just really start noticing those patterns in the dream through journaling of like, yeah, this this thing keeps coming up. Can I notice when I experience that in the day? Can I notice when I'm experiencing that in the dream? Um, so yeah, just uh, thank you for kind of taking us on a journey of the ethereal, the practical, like all the all the sides of things. And again, I think that's what makes you such an interesting teacher is that you are able to meet people where they are. So uh, I'm just grateful. So, I'm grateful so to know you. So beautifully said. I mean, so it's so um, your insights and I know your practice with us have been really deep. So it's such a it's such a joy to be able to have these conversations with you know and someone who has that understanding and personal experience. Thank you. Mm, thank you. And for anyone who's interested in more of this, um, you could check out Mia's website. We'll put that in the show notes. Uh, check out her coaching programs. I also have studied under Andrew Holacek. So you could check out Mia's, Mia's courses with Andrew as well. And then for anyone book-wise, Dreams of Awakening sounds like a great place to start for someone who's looking. I hope your book is coming soon. My books are all fiction. I'm, I'm writing, uh, I'm going mainstream media. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, we'll read that too. So, stories for stories for teenagers, you know. Yes, fantastic. But yes, I so appreciate the time, and I hope I hope everyone enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed talking about it. And uh, yeah, happy happy dreams. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. My pleasure.